All right, so uh, let's get going on our class uh, today. So um, uh, just to kind of let you guys know two things. Number one, um, I forgot to grab the uh, signing sheets uh, from my office. So we are watching a video today. So during that time, I will slip out. I'll uh, just bring them in, pass them around. So you will still be receiving attendance points uh, for today. And uh, also, uh, speaking of uh, points, I just want to make sure, I'll send in an announcement for this, but I just want to make sure everybody's aware uh, that uh, there are bonus points available for completing the course evaluation. So course evaluations are now um, available. And uh, um, we use these course evaluations, uh, faculty use these course evaluations to help us improve our courses, so they're very important uh, that we can get feedback. So there's many different choices that we can make in a particular course. So it really helps us to know if you found anything that was ineffective, that did not contribute to learning, but even more so than that, anything that was effective, because it's very hard to find these highly effective learning experiences, highly effective examples that we use, so that when we do find one, it's very helpful for us to know that, yes, this one was particularly effective. So. If you can consider that when you're doing your, uh, your course evaluations, I would uh, highly appreciate it. And uh, other than your uh, civic duty to uh, uh, help improve the course and improve the learning experiences of future generations of IUSB students, I will also be awarding 1% uh, towards your final grade. That's how important it is uh, uh, to get this feedback for completing the course evaluation. So when you complete your course evaluation, either get a screenshot of that final confirmation page uh, and upload that to Canvas. There's a course evaluation assignment tab where you can upload that for your uh, 1%. Or if you have already completed it, go to your sign-in page and it should indicate that you have completed that particular uh, course. Take a screenshot of that, upload that. Uh, thank you so much for uh, doing those in advance. And again, I will um, uh, give 1% towards your final uh, grade. So one bonus percent uh, for helping us out to improve our courses. All right, so what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be taking a look at ethics in the psychology of learning. But before we get to that, uh, just real quick, uh, I want to mention the final exam uh, that is coming up. So the final exam is going to be on Tuesday, December 11th. So it's a week from uh, today. It's going to be during, uh, during class time. Uh, it's non-cumulative. So it only is going to cover the chapters since the uh, since exam number three. So it's final exam in name only. Really, it's just exam number four. And it will cover uh, chapter 11, uh, observational learning, rule governed behavior. It'll cover chapter 12, biological dispositions to learning. And it'll cover this last week where we're looking at uh, ethics. And it will also include the movie that we're going to watch, uh, questions about that movie. So just to let you know uh, the movie is available uh, um, either streaming or for rent from, for example, Amazon uh, Prime, uh, last time that I checked. Uh, so it's not that difficult to find online. Uh, however, the questions are made so that if you pay attention during a single viewing of the film, that should be enough for you to be able to answer the question. So I'm not gonna ask you anything about whose name is this and who's this person and with this little small detail that occurred. But I will ask you about the ethics of certain behaviors that uh, individuals in the movie did. And I will describe the individuals in a way that uh, allows you to identify who they are. So uh, one of the protagonists, her name is Julie. I will say things like, Julie, you know, who uh, owned the white dog or who found the white dog when she brought them to Noah's Ark you know, what occurred. So you'll have enough information to jog uh, your memory. If you're still worried, maybe take like just a few notes, uh, but there are web pages that'll give you synopses of this movie. I'd rather that you kind of pay attention and take in these sort of ethical lessons uh, that are illustrated in this, uh, in this film. All right, so in terms of the uh, format, format's not gonna change. Like I said, it's just exam number four. So it's still gonna be multiple choice. Still gonna have two sections. Section number one is gonna cover material from the reading that we didn't get to cover in class just due to time constraints. That's gonna be worth the third of your score. That will be recognition type questions only. Section number two will cover material from the readings that were covered in class and additional material in the lecture. So for example, the White Dog movie. Uh, and that's gonna be worth two thirds of your score. 
And that can include both recognition type questions and more advanced uh, application type questions. All right, any uh, questions about the final exam? Yep. You're, you're expected to watch the online lecture. Well, I, know, I know that the online class yep. is kind of a separate yep. from what we did. So we have to go over the, um, the presentation from last week that we didn't finish. And it's also the online class? Or is it the online class? No, we'll finish what we didn't finish like early today. Um, but definitely the online class is separate. We're not going to go over what was on the online class. And those are included. I, I'm pretty sure I had them up there. But those are also included on what's being covered on the exam. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right. So today uh, we will be uh, filling in that gap. So we will be wrapping up our look at objective sexuals uh, by taking a look at um, uh, preparedness, uh, that uh, biological disposition in learning, and also taking a look at sign tracking. So hopefully you were able to uh, watch the online video that went through the kind of uh, textbook examples of those two, so that now we can apply them to our understanding of Erica Eiffel. We will then uh, talk a little bit about uh, ethical principles of psychologists in the code of conduct, uh, talk a bit about speciesism and guidelines for the ethical conduct in the care and use of non-human animals in research. So in terms of ethics for animal use, there is a entirely separate section uh, for the ethics of animal use. And then uh, the last thing that we'll do is watch part one of white dog and I'll set it up and we're going to treat it as almost like if you were a uh, clinical psychologist for animals, um, whether or not you would be able to diagnose what is the issue with the titular white dog. All right, so to get back to OS, uh, we have Erica Eiffel here. And uh, Erica Eiffel, if you recall, very typical a uh, human being uh, in every single way, very high functioning, very successful in a number of different areas uh, of her life, um, but uh, came to our attention because she is what's known as an objectum sexual. She falls in love with inanimate objects. So she fell in love with a bridge nearby, uh, near her home when she was a teenager. Uh, she fell in love with the Eiffel Tower. She fell in love with the Berlin Wall. She actually married the Eiffel Tower, she changed her name to Erica Eiffel, and uh, you know has many typical behaviors uh, that uh, people uh, with, um, you know, uh, people that fall in love with humans do, but it's except it's um, directed towards objects. So uh, hopefully you saw the, the Tyra Banks videos, but I just want to mention, in case you didn't, just a really uh, quick kind of synopsis about when she fell in love with the Eiffel Tower. So she went on a vacation to Paris with a group of friends. And while uh, she was on that vacation, as you do in Paris, she went to go see the Eiffel Tower. And uh, when she was viewing the Eiffel Tower, uh, all of a sudden the Eiffel Tower just lit up, like lights you know, went up and down the Eiffel Tower. And they were like, oh my gosh, this is so beautiful. And uh, after that occurred, she found out that the Eiffel Tower doesn't typically do that. That's not something that it's supposed to do. It was like a glitch in its system. And she took that as the Eiffel Tower proposing to her. And that was um, partly what led to her falling in love with the Eiffel Tower. So let's take a look at how we can explain this behavior. And specifically, how can we explain it in a very, uh, using very basic, very typical psychological <laughs> mechanisms? So we talked about preparedness uh, last time. Preparedness is how we are biologically predisposed. We are biologically hardwired to form certain associations, to learn certain things. So preparedness in terms of taste aversion, for example, has a very specific characteristic where there's the formation of associations over long delays. So that temporal contiguity that we saw was so helpful in regular classical conditioning actually works against taste aversion where it's a long delay that is the best delay for uh, taste aversion conditioning. But other aspects of preparedness that are more general uh, include one trial conditioning. So to develop a fear of spiders, you don't need multiple instances 
or multiple trials uh, combining uh, a spider with the unconditioned stimulus of fear. You really only need one and you've been trained to be afraid of spiders. So things that are common fears, uh, spiders, snakes, heights, uh, speaking in a, you know, in front of people in public, those typically only take one trial to condition. You typically only, uh, you know, if somebody's afraid of speaking in public, typically they have that one bad experience that they, that they had, and that causes this very large uh, association to occur. And then the last thing that we saw was the specificity of association. So when somebody tastes something or eats something and it makes them nauseous, uh, they develop a specific association between the nauseousness and the taste of the food or the smell of the food. And that is, in, and that is ignoring just about every other stimulus that was around them at the time. So if it was somebody at a Christmas party and they tried some fruitcake and an hour later they're throwing up in the bathroom because something was bad with the fruitcake, they will form a taste aversion to fruitcake and not to any of the other stimuli that were present at the time. So if Bing Crosby's White Christmas was playing in the background, they will not form that association and they won't feel nauseous the next time they hear that song. If uh, they were looking at twinkling Christmas lights on the tree, they will not form that association between the lights and their nausea, uh, and they won't feel nauseous the next time they see a decorated Christmas tree. And this is because of the specificity of association. So it's key that all these stimuli were present. They were present when they experienced that unconditioned stimulus of the taste, sorry, that conditioned stimulus of the taste, but they didn't associate any of those other ones. It was the taste that was associated with the nausea. And then the last thing that we took a look at was operant respondent interaction, specifically sign tracking. And this is where an approach behavior that typically occurs to an appetitive event occurs to the signal for that appetitive event. So when dogs were trained to press a panel in order to receive food, only when a certain light was on, the light was the discriminative stimulus for reinforcement, they started to do approach behaviors to the light. And these approach behaviors mimicked what they did to the appetitive event, which was the food. So they started biting the light, they started licking the light, uh, they started putting their mouth on the light. And we use this to uh, potentially explain why in our society, so many uh, romantic dates where you're trying to take yourself as a discriminative stimulus for reinforcement and uh, change yourself to that conditioned stimulus, um, why is it that we incur, uh, we uh, use dinner or typically some form of eating in every romantic date? It might have something to do with trying to get those eating behaviors, like bringing something close to your mouth, uh, putting something on your lips, uh, and try to transfer those behaviors to um, ourselves. All right, so we have these basic mechanisms that work in everybody. So everybody has these mechanisms that work in themselves. And let's see if we can put them together and figure out what is happening with Erica Eiffel. So what might be going on with Erica Eiffel where some things are working very, very well in her mind, uh, some things are cross-wired, and uh, other things uh, are not gonna be important here. So just to give you a hint, the formation of association over long delays probably is not gonna be part of why she fell in love when she went on that trip with her friends to Paris, why she fell in love with the Eiffel Tower. All right, so any ideas about what might be going on here? And maybe we could start with sign tracking. All right, I'll give you another hint. When you're going on vacation, typically, hopefully, if you have a good vacation, is gonna be filled with appetitive events, right? So when you go to Paris, you're gonna go see a wonderful museum, right? And that's an appetitive event. That's something that you uh, will approach. Uh, the food there, uh, you know, fine French cuisine, you're gonna have 
you know, some wonderful uh, food experiences there, you're going to have those appetitive events. Think about, without giving it too much, uh, giving it away too much, what is something that you're probably, what is a stimulus that is probably going to be present for most of your experiences when you're in Paris? What was that? Uh, think of a stimulus that is going to be present, something that you can see for most of your experiences in Paris. If you're out and about in Paris, the Eiffel Tower. So I grew up in Toronto. We have the CN Tower, and you can see the CN Tower just about everywhere in the city. In fact, it's one of those great landmarks. If you never know which way is south, you find the CN Tower, and you're like, oh, that's south. So every single experience that she had in this, uh, in this uh, vacation would have had the Eiffel Tower present, right? So you go to a fine restaurant and they sit you outside and you're enjoying the meal, you're having a great time. Oh look, it's the Eiffel Tower, right? You come out of the museum and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe what painting, what a, what a great aesthetic experience. Oh hey, check it out, the Eiffel Tower. You're walking around town and you're like, oh my goodness, look at all the wonderful architecture they have here in this year. Oh, look, it's the Eiffel Tower. So the Eiffel Tower was one of the stimuli that was there during her, uh, during her time. So in the same way that the dogs started showing approach behaviors to the light that signaled you know, these uh, appetitive events, it's quite possible that through sign tracking, um, Erica Eiffel started developing these approach behaviors uh, towards the signal for her fun times in Paris, towards the Eiffel Tower. And it's interesting that it was, in fact, the Eiffel Tower that she, uh, that she um, uh, developed her associations with rather than other monuments like the... Um, the um, the Arc de Triomphe, right, which cannot be seen from as many places as the Eiffel Tower. So there wasn't as many uh, trials as there would have been with the Eiffel Tower. So it's quite possible that she had these approach behaviors to that appetitive event uh, and to that Eiffel Tower simply because it was present for many of these uh, contingencies that were reinforcing, for many of these times when she had a good time in, uh, in Paris. So that's the sign tracking aspect of it. And notice it's working just like it works in everybody else, right? Eiffel Tower is a discriminative stimulus for reinforcement. She saw the Eiffel Tower was present during all these contingencies when she was being reinforced. She starts to have approach behaviors towards the Eiffel Tower. So now let's take a look at preparedness. Formation of association over long delays. I don't think that's really either here or there in terms of what might be going on with Erica Eiffel. However, in terms of one trial conditioning, it seems that at the very least, one trial conditioning is working in Erica Eiffel um, and probably uh, working pretty well. So she did not spend years in Paris. Uh, she did not have this slowly building you know, affection towards the Eiffel Tower. It wasn't what, uh, like what sometimes happens in relationships where you're friends with somebody for years and then all of a sudden things change and all of a sudden you're like, well, you know, this person seems to be, I'm, I'm a little bit attracted to them now. It seems to have been this almost one trial conditioning. It was very few trials at the least because she wasn't in Paris for very long when she was feeling those associations. So that one trial conditioning, if you've ever experienced love at first sight, you've experienced one trial conditioning. So that seems to at least be working, if not at a normal level, maybe a little bit more, a little bit stronger in Erica Eiffel. But what about specificity of associations? Is that working in a typical way in Erica Eiffel, or is this where it's atypical in her mind?
So Paris is known as the city of love because people go there and they fall in love. And who do they fall in love with? They fall in love with each other, exactly. They fall in love with the people that they went with, right? So it's very typical. You know, you, you hear this all the time. You hear about people have that summer romance, right? That summer fling where they go out to an area. They're having a wonderful time. All of a sudden, this person is there. That person becomes a discriminative stimulus. And because they're having such a wonderful time and they're being reinforced, that person becomes a discriminative stimulus for reinforcement which leads to a approach behaviors, literally makes the person attractive, right? You approach them, you're attracted to them. So this specific, uh, sorry, this uh, is typically what happens when somebody goes to Paris. Erica Eiffel went to Paris with a group of people. She went there with a group of friends. But who did she fall in love with? She fell in love with the Eiffel Tower. So she had her friends with her when uh, she was having all these wonderful experiences. And she saw the Eiffel Tower when she was having all these wonderful experiences. And both of those stimuli could have been where her association formed, right? Both of those stimuli had the potential to form that association uh, between her good times, her uh, contingencies of reinforcement and those uh, those stimuli. And unlike a typical person, something is cross-wired in her specificity of associations. Because for us, if we went to Paris and we were having this wonderful time and we were looking at our friends and we were being reinforced, they could turn into discriminative stimuli for reinforcement that we now have approach behaviors to. Right? And how many of us have known, either it happened to us or it happened to uh, people that we know, where they go off on a group vacation and all of a sudden they come back and they're dating. Right? They go off on a group vacation and all of a sudden they come back and they're like, you know what, I, we've been friends for years and I never looked at them in this particular way, but now something has changed and my feelings have changed and I don't know what's going on. Sign tracking. Right? It's not romantic. Don't tell them that. But sign tracking is going on. But importantly, it's that specificity of associations. So everything about Erica Eiffel is working exactly like it does in a typical individual, but something about her brain has crosswired that specificity of associations so that when her mind has to make up a has to make that decision between am I going to associate this reinforcing event with this person over here? Or am I going to reinforce? Uh, or am I going to associate this reinforcing event with the Eiffel Tower? Her mind, because of the special crosswire specificity of associations, makes the association with the Eiffel Tower. A typical person's mind will make that association with another individual, and that might be the only thing that is different between Eric Eiffel and how we operate. Because again, everything else, she fell in love while she was on vacation, for example seems to be operating exactly the same. All right, any questions about that? Make sense? All right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to introduce uh, the um, uh, ethical part of this, uh, of this course. So this is an important um, component to this course because um, this is literally the most powerful course that you're going to take in your psychology undergraduate career. And what I mean by that is the things that you have learned in this course, you can actually go out and apply these and change behavior in yourself, in other people. You have those techniques uh, and they're highly effective even at the level that you are familiar with them right now. Contrast that to another course where if you took abnormal psychology, you will be in no position to diagnose and treat anybody with a mental disorder. And in fact, you are going to have to go to school for many, many more years before they'll let you near somebody to treat them if they have a mental disorder. However, with the things that you've learned in this class, you could literally go out 
today and train a dog to do certain behaviors. You could literally go out today and improve your relationships with other people by putting in contingencies that change their good behaviors and their bad behaviors. So it's a very powerful course. So we're gonna end it with ethics to make sure that you use that power responsibly, that you go out there and you help your fellow individuals rather than uh, you know having uh, a large number of mad scientists unleashed upon the world on my conscience. I don't need that. So we're gonna go over these ethical principles and we're gonna show you uh, uh, how these ethical principles are designed to protect uh, the individuals that we work with, they're done to protect the psychologists that use them, and they're also done to protect psychology in general. So uh, the general principles laid out by the American Psychological Association, we'll go over them, all five of those. Uh, the general principles, principle A, uh, beneficence and non-maleficence, uh, principle B, fidelity and responsibility, principle C is integrity, principle D is justice, and principle E is respect uh, for people's rights and dignity. Those are the five kind of ethical guidelines that the APA has identified for anybody who is doing psychology work. So this doesn't, this applies if you're a clinical psychologist, this applies if you're an experimental psychologist, this applies if you're teaching, psych, teaching psychology, this applies if you're a social worker, whatever it is, if you're doing psychology, these are the guidelines uh, that'll help you make sure that you're an ethical uh, user of psychology. All right, so the first one, the principle of beneficence and non-maleficence. This is the idea that psychologists, as much as possible, strive to benefit those with whom they work and they take care to do no harm. And this one is at the top of ethical decisions because, or ethical um, criteria, because this is the most crucial aspect of whether or not something is an ethical decision in psychology. So typically when you are thinking about, is this an ethical treatment? Is this an ethical behavior? Is this an ethical way to treat an individual in psychology? What you're looking for is what is going to maximize the benefits for this individual and what is going to minimize the harm for this individual. So we saw this, for example, with Dr. Fox's treatment of Harry. Dr. Fox's treatment of Harry was very ethical because the benefits to Harry, which is you know, a life free of self-abuse, far outweighed the harm that they were causing Harry. So they did cause Harry harm. Number one, they took away his restraints. Literally the thing that he loved the most in this world, they took him away. Uh, two, they made him you know, follow their orders. Uh, they were going to give him brief contingent electrical shocks, right? So they did have a certain amount of harm already programmed into their treatment, but it was an ethical treatment because the benefit to Harry far outweighed the harm that he would have, uh, that he had to go through to get there. So that's kind of the overall guiding uh, principle for any ethical decisions in psychology. And the harder it is to make an ethical decision occurs when those get extremely close, right? So it would actually be unethical not to treat Harry. It would be unethical to take a look at Harry's situation and say, you know what, we are never gonna cause harm to anybody. You know, you are not allowed to take away his restraints because that's gonna harm him, right? So we're not gonna do this treatment. That would be highly unethical because the benefit far outweighs the harm. So that's the first principle, beneficence and non-maleficence. And when we're taking a look at the movie, uh, the White Dog movie, take a look at decisions made in that movie and ask yourself, what was the benefit that came out of that decision? What was the harm that came out of that decision? And try to think about whether or not it was an ethical decision for that particular character uh, to make. All right, other ones, we got fidelity and responsibility. So uh, psychologists uh, try to establish relationships of trust with whom they uh, work. So we do try to build these uh, trust relationships. This is number two, I think partly because psychologists have used so much deception previously in their work and in their research that very few people in our society trust a psychologist. So if you ever, you know, if you ever go to a, a party and you meet somebody new and they're like, oh, what do you do? And you say, oh, I'm a psychologist. 
you know, they'll often say things like, well, don't, don't go reading my mind. Uh, you know, don't, uh, don't try to diagnose me. Basically, what they're saying is like, well, I'm going to joke about it, but I kind of don't trust you. Right. Nobody does that with anybody else. Nobody does that with, you know, oh, what do you do? Oh, I'm an oncologist. Uh, don't be trying to cure my cancer. You know, uh, don't be doing that. We have this mistrust uh, that we have partly earned, uh, let's face it. So principle B, establish those relationships of trust and uh, be responsible to the communities within which you work. So don't hoard your abilities, you know, and, and give back to the communities uh, that you work within. Uh, principle C, integrity. Uh, try to be accurate, honest, truthful uh, when you're doing the science, when you're doing the teaching, when you're doing the practice of psychology. So always strive uh, for truth um, as much as possible. Some of the theories that we had as psychologists turned out to be wrong, and that's just the way the science works. But intentional fraud, um, intentional deception uh, is, again, an unethical uh, decision. Principle D, justice. Uh, basically, this is uh, the idea that we should not discriminate as psychologists. So psychologists uh, recognize fairness and justice. Uh, all people are entitled to, your, to benefit from your contributions. So this doesn't mean that you cannot ethically specialize. It doesn't mean that uh, Dr. Schultz, who specialized in developmental psychology and is basically focusing on children and ignoring helping adults, that doesn't mean that she's unethical. However, when she helps children, it's all children, right? So it's not just rich children and it's not just, uh, um, you know, uh, other uh, societal uh, marginalities uh, that she, you know, excludes. She helps everybody. And that's the principle of justice. And the last one in the basic five principles is the respect for people's rights and dignity. And uh, this is the respect for the dignity and worth of all people and the rights of individuals to privacy, confidentiality, and self-determination. So those are the three big things that psychologists try to safeguard. So uh, privacy, uh, confidentiality, those indicate whether or not uh, basically how much information uh, is going to be given out to the public about your interaction with that psychologist. So, for example, if you're in a clinical psychology setting, typically you have that doctor patient confidentiality where you cannot talk about your uh, your patient and their treatment without you know, certain criteria being met. And they're very, very specific. When I do an experiment. I have in my informed consent form, I let the subjects know exactly how their data is going to be treated and exactly who's going to get to see it. So they know that no names will be attached to the data. Uh, nobody will know that it's their responses, but I will be reporting this uh, data in terms of averages, in terms of uh, scores at conferences and things like that. So that allows you to have self-determination, whether or not you want to participate. And also self-determination extends to any um, psychological uh, phenomenon where the person has the right to say what happens to them. And uh, psychologists are aware of the special safeguards that might be necessary to protect the rights and welfare of persons who, uh, or communities whose vulnerab vulnerabilities impair their autonomous decision-making. So basically, if you have certain vulnerabilities that don't allow you to uh, make your own decisions or impairs your ability to make your own decisions, there are special safeguards that are in place for those individuals. So one of the safeguards that we have in terms of making sure that what we do is ethical is we have an internal review board. So whenever I want to do an experiment, I have to write up exactly what I'm going to do in that experiment and I submit it to the IRB and the IRB takes a look at it and says, okay, or they say, nope, change this. We need to make it ethical. This change needs to be made. So when I do that, because I use subjects who do not have an impaired ability to make decisions, they are not impaired in any way for their own self-determination. Basically, I use adult uh, psychology students. My IRB forms are, are very, very small. If I used subjects who cannot make that decision for themselves or are impaired, that IRB form grows exponentially. 
So if you ever do experiments on children, so there's, there's um, three big uh, categories of people who are protected. Children are protected, right? We, you cannot just ask a child, do you want to do this experiment? I'll give you a chocolate bar. And if they say yes, end it there, right? They have, you have to check with their guardians. There's special protocols to protect children. Um, people that are mentally challenged, right? Special protocols to protect them as well. And then the last one, uh, which I learned a few years ago, is prisoners. Prisoners by themselves uh, have uh, diminished uh, self-determination, right? Because I can say to myself right now, I can say, you know what, I'm gonna self-determine that I'm gonna walk out that door and I'm going to leave this building. Prisoners can't do that, right? That's what makes them prisoners. So we, as uh, psychologists, take very special care whenever somebody cannot make that, uh, that decision for themselves. All right, so those are the five basic uh, principles. The last thing that I want to mention is that there is a special subset of rules specifically for animal research. And one of the reasons, there's two reasons why animal research in psychology exists. One of them is because people are interested in animals. Some people just want to know how a dog's mind works. Some people just want to know how you know uh, a cat's mind works. Um, there is an individual that he was part of a documentary who was just fascinated with the naked mole rat for no other reason than he just loved the naked mole rat. So part of the reason why we do experiments on animals is to find out more about those animals. The other reason, though, is that oftentimes you can do experiments on animals and control them in certain ways that you cannot do with human beings. So it's ethical, and some people question this, but it's ethical to raise a rat in captivity, control their environment so that you can use them in a Skinner box so they can press a bar and earn food. If I did that to a human baby, I would be arrested so fast and sent to jail for so long because it's unethical to do that, right? I can't buy babies, keep them in a controlled environment for uh, you know 10 years and then run them, you know, it's, it's not even a question. So it has to do with what do you think the rights of animals are compared to the rights of humans? And uh, Singer brought up this idea of speciesism that we discriminate basically and neglect the rights of other species because we're speciesist, right? We, we're kind of reserve rights for our own, uh, our own um, species, but deny these rights to other species. So that is an interesting idea. And it cannot be the case that, or most people would not think, that animals deserve the same rights that humans do in total. Because you would not let an adult animal vote for, uh, for your government. Um, when a human being is murdered by somebody else, you will go out, our society will go out and try to track down the person that murdered the murderer and we will put them on trial and we will send them to jail if possible. But when a lion eats a gazelle, there is nobody tracking down that lion and talking to gazelles and asking for witness reports so they can put that lion away. So the rights of animals do not quite meet the rights of humans. And I think most people can recognize that. The question though, however, is how many rights do animals have? So where do they end up in terms of what should be protected, what shouldn't be protected? And that is a question that we will not get into but again, it's uh, this idea of how much protection do animals receive. So we're going to start the movie right now. So just so that you know, there is this uh, extra little bit of information uh, that I would ask you to read um, on uh, the ethical, some highlights for the ethical conduct uh, for the care of non-human animals in research. And there is a lot. I mean, I went through a lot of training when I first uh, started um, working with animals, uh, pigeons and rats, in terms of how to train them. But what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna watch, uh, we're gonna start the movie, uh, White Dog. And uh, while you're watching this movie, it's, it's about a white dog. Um, it will not be recorded for copyright reasons. I'm gonna pause the recording uh, during the time when the movie's up. But I just, uh, what I would like you to do is during the movie, Try to figure out, it's going to be pretty obvious, what the uh, behavior is that is the problem behavior 
for this white dog. So try to identify what's the problem behavior that this white dog is showing and try to figure out what is the discriminative stimulus for reinforcement that triggers that behavior. And we'll kind of put you in the shoes of a clinical psychologist. If this white dog was your client uh, and you observe their behavior, can you diagnose what is the discriminative stimulus for reinforcement? All right, so without further ado, so that's where we're gonna end it uh, for today. So you've seen the dog's uh, behavior. Clearly, the dog's an attack dog. Um, and uh, what you wanna do between now and uh, next class is try to think back on what you've seen as if you're a clinical psychologist working with uh, this dog's behavior and try to think about the behavior of uh, attacking was reinforced during this dog's training, but what is the discriminative stimulus that was used? Basically, what is the trigger for that attacking behavior? And another thing that I'll mention before we go is that this movie, one of the reasons that I really uh, I use it in this context is it has just about every psychological principle that we've seen in learning incorporated into the movie. So next time we're gonna see classical conditioning, we're gonna see operant conditioning, we're gonna see extinction paradigms, uh, we're going to see a lot of different uh, intermittent uh, schedules of reinforcement. And just to kind of um, <clears throat> bring up uh, something we've already seen, that line that uh, Roland, the boyfriend, said about, you know, nobody can uh, train that dog and guarantee it 100%, nobody can. And then Carruthers here, next time uh, we pick it up, is going to, uh, I love the phrase, he goes, can't nobody unlearn an attack dog, nobody. And what they're talking about is extinction paradigms and how the stimulus never gets to be unlearned, right? We saw that with spontaneous recovery. Uh, we saw that with disinhibition. So it's a very uh, scientifically accurate movie. There's one exception I'll point it out next time. But uh, for next time, try to think about what is that discriminative stimulus for reinforcement uh, that makes this uh, dog uh, do the behavior of attacking. Other than that, we are done for today.